Hi friends, I'm back. It's been a minute. I hope you're all doing well. I didn't mean to disappear for so long. I've just been really busy and really overwhelmed with how much is going on in my life. Um, and making YouTube videos is genuinely a lot of work. I'm so impressed with these like bigger creators that make a video every single week and never miss a week for like years because that's really hard to do. So I'm sorry that I was MIA, but my schedule for the next few weeks is uh, still busy, but relatively reasonable. So I should be around to chat cool design stuff with you guys. And today I want to talk about materials, materiality, as architects and designers love to say. I didn't really realize that that was like a weird design thing until a few of you pointed it out in my comments. Anyway, today we're talking about materiality and more specifically, I want to talk about how to put together a material palette for your interior and sort of frame a guideline for how to think about materials. In general, I think it's usually really important to bring in a wide range of materials into a space to give it a certain depth and interest. And I get that balancing multiple materials and achieving that sort of cohesiveness and harmony that we see in really beautiful interiors can be a challenging thing to do. And I do want to give a very brief disclaimer for those of you who might be new here. Uh, we do have one very strict rule on my channel, and that is honest materials, authentic materials, meaning no vinyl flooring that's meant to look like hardwood, no tile that's printed to look like marble, or potentially one of my least favorite things on the planet, plastic faux plants. Nothing fake, nothing faux. Because I just truly believe that the beauty in interior design and all spatial or environmental design for that matter is in creating spaces that feel solid and thoughtful and authentic and just very human. And I don't think that we achieve that by using inauthentic materials. I talk about this a lot and one of my first videos on YouTube was actually entirely on this topic. So if you're interested in this topic, I invite you to go watch that video after this video. But yes, I am a firm believer in the idea that there are no bad materials as long as they are authentic. So everything I'm about to say is within the framework of honest, authentic, real materials. So let's dive into it, but really quick, I want to take a second to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Ritual. So Ritual is a dietary supplement brand that I really love mainly because they're entirely transparent about their products. All of their products are made traceable, which means they tell you where their labeled ingredients are from, why they're there, and how their products are validated. I've been taking Ritual's Essential for Men multivitamin, which is a clinically backed high quality multivitamin for men ages 18 to 49. It helps to fill key nutrient gaps in your diet, and just like all of Ritual products, it's third-party tested, non-GMO certified, vegan friendly and formulated without any major allergens. Basically, everything you could want in a multivitamin. Along with that, I've been taking Ritual's Stress Relief, which supports your body's normal cortisol response with a first-of-its-kind technology that provides instant and extended eight-hour stress relief. I do a lot of things every day to help manage my stress, but I genuinely notice a really big difference when I take this. So yeah, I really recommend checking out Ritual. They're offering my viewers 25% off your first order. Just click the link down in the description. And thank you again to Ritual for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so like I said, I think that most really great interiors bring together a lot of different materials to create a space that feels balanced and cohesive. And I think the key to a successful material palette is to focus on contrast and to think about your materials on a spectrum. And there are a lot of different spectrums. Okay, I'm hearing myself and I realize this might not be super clear or easy to follow, so I hope I can explain this well. If I have time, I might put together some diagrams to show you here. I would say that the spectrum that I usually think about first 
because I think it's the most impactful is this sort of spectrum between soft and hard materials or maybe the better word for it would be like natural to man-made like on one end of the spectrum you have things like woven textiles and wood things that feel very soft and natural right and then it moves into things like uh, brick certain natural stones textured ceramics um, leather maybe even certain concrete applications I might put somewhere around here. And then maybe moving on to things that feel more man-made, but still relatively soft. Things like linoleum, uh, painted elements, fiberglass, acrylic, laminate, things like that. And then moving into the other end of the spectrum, things that feel like harder and less hospitable. Things like uh, glass, glossy tiles, uh, and I would say at the furthest end of this spectrum is like metals, right? I feel like this makes sense, right? At least I hope it does. Tell me if this is something that I just like made up in my head and it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but I feel like you can take any two materials and understand which one is like harder or softer on this spectrum. And obviously it's not like actually about hardness and softness. It's not really the right word for it because I would say something like linoleum flooring feels harder than something like a raw natural stone tile because obviously it's not actually harder. It's just like a vibe thing, right? Maybe a better word for it is like sharper or like harsher. I don't know, but we can all agree that metal feels harsher than fabric, right? I think that harsher is definitely a better word for this. And obviously there isn't like a strict place on this spectrum for each material. A highly reflective polished marble floor is going to feel way harsher than like a more raw matte limestone floor tile. So it's not as simple as just saying like stone is in one place on this spectrum that I made up. <laughs> so I hope that we're on the same page about this spectrum, or at least the concept of it. And what we want to do is use this way of thinking about materials to create some balance in our spaces. I would say that the sort of tried and true easiest way of doing this is to bring in some nice wood furniture with some fabric upholstery, and then sort of cut it with a much harsher material, like a metallic table, for example. Because when you bring in materials from the sort of further ends of that spectrum, you get this interesting tension and contrast between them that just makes a space feel more deep and ultimately more balanced. And I think it's nice to also bring in materials that are between those sort of extreme ends to not just have that very obvious contrast, but also moments of like a more subtle contrast. Along with that, I would say it's important to think about achieving this balance throughout your entire home, but also within each sort of smaller vignette within your space. Make sure that you're mixing materials within each little zone. I feel like when I talk about interiors on my channel, pretty often I come back to this spectrum of sort of harshness. Maybe you guys have noticed that. But the thing is, there are many more spectrums to consider with your material palette. So for example, maybe you could think of this sort of harshness spectrum along your x-axis, but then you also need to consider a y-axis of uh, value, for example, meaning how much light a material is absorbing. And we want to be sure that not all of our materials are the same in that consideration as well. So you want contrast along that x-axis as well as the y-axis, if that makes sense. And there are so many other spectrums to think about, right? Like texture is a really big one for me, how rough or smooth a material feels. I think this is generally why I advise people to bring a lot of materials into their space because it takes a pretty huge amount of materials to achieve 
this contrast and balance in so many different categories and considerations. I also think that color and saturation are a huge thing to consider here, but I have so much to say about color, I think it deserves its own video in the future. I would say the most common way I see material palettes go wrong, and I think it's a pretty easy trap to fall into, is when people stay within a very narrow place on any of these spectrums. And I assume that most people do this because they feel like bringing in a contrasting material is maybe kind of intimidating or like too risky for their space. So they just sort of stay in their like material comfort zone. But most of the time introducing a contrasting material to sort of break up that feeling is the ticket that we need to achieve that really good and nice balance that we love to see. And of course there are people who stay within a very narrow material spectrum not because they're intimidated by bringing in contrasting materials, but rather in a very intentional way, like that's the aesthetic that they're going for. I feel like we see this so much with the sort of monochrome, like clean girls and clean boy aesthetics, spaces that the haters would call like sad beige interiors, if you know what I mean. And I think that the issue here is that creating a very exceptional interior with a limited palette is actually a really really difficult thing to do in my opinion it absolutely can be done but i think that you need one an architecturally significant distinct or impressive space and two a thoughtful consideration of lighting whether it be daylight or electric light. For example, I really love Kim Kardashian's home that she worked on with Axel Vervoort. Uh, I feel like that's a very controversial interior on the internet, uh, but I think it's a really wonderful example of how to work with a minimal palette. But the reason that it works, in my opinion, is because the architecture of her home is so impressive and it has such a thoughtful consideration of how it interacts with daylight and that allows for the material palette to take a very intentional back seat to the actual form of the space like i just think that this monochromatic mono material approach works best when it's working in harmony with the architecture of the space i'm usually most impressed with this when it's on a more monumental scale and it's almost always dependent on a thoughtful consideration of daylight from the architecture. Another example that comes to mind is the almost entirely brick interiors of Alvar Alto's San Atzalo Town Hall um, and I think that's another pretty obvious example of the architecture allowing for this very narrow approach to materials. So all of that is to say, I think it's really hard to make this work in like a cookie cutter two bedroom apartment. I think that's why a lot of these sort of sad beige interiors sort of fall short of being nice spaces and end up feeling very flat. It's just that the architecture of the building is calling for a different approach to the interior. Okay, so I hope I'm not rambling too much and you guys are tracking with me, but I want to talk about using this idea of contrast within material families themselves. And I think the most relevant example here would be with wood and wood tones. I think that so many people get confused here because they think that all of the wood tones throughout their home need to match. And I don't think it will surprise any of you after everything I've just said that I don't think that that generally looks very good. Even within the wood, pieces in your space, I think you should try to achieve a certain level of contrast in the value of your wood tones. This is a diagram that I made that I probably share with like 90% of my consultation clients because this idea comes up in so many people's homes. An interior will just feel so much deeper and richer if you have a wide range of different wood tones with different values. Again, value meaning like 
how light or dark a material is. But I personally think the best way to do this is to stick to a common undertone with all of your wood tones, whether that be cool, neutral, or warm. So essentially you want to pull from a lot of different wood tones vertically in this diagram, but try to avoid crossing horizontally, especially if two wood tones are the same value. I think that usually ends up looking uh, pretty off. And I would say the same thing for other material families as well. For example, metals. It's nice to keep a common undertone while bringing in a variety of different metals. Although it really doesn't bother me as much when, for example, gold and silver metals that are the same value are incorporated into the same interior. I guess it's because metals are typically used in like smaller accents and details, whereas wood furniture takes up a pretty good amount of like visual real estate and sort of dominates a room. And similarly with wood tones, I'm not super offended by like small accents that don't adhere to this guideline. Like for example, a picture frame or like a small decor piece. I'm more talking about large pieces in your space that really kind of dominate your material palette. I think it comes down to a matter of scale and how prominent a material is in your space. Okay, and the last thing that I want to sort of touch on is this idea of materials trending. People love to talk about how certain materials are dated or will be dated because they're really trendy at the moment. And I just really reject that concept. Obviously different materials will have periods where they're more popular in certain years or decades. Like that's just how people work, things trend. But just because a material was popular at a certain point in time, doesn't mean it's necessarily bad. Honestly, like even the opposite, I think there's kind of a cool value in a material time stamping a space and kind of marking the history of a building or an interior. Like pink bathroom tile from the 1950s can be super cool if you know how to work with it. And honey oak kitchen cabinetry from the 1990s can be super cool if you know how to work with it. The same goes for modern farmhouse white subway tile from the past decade. Or people are even starting to say it about like white oak cabinetry, which just finished having its moment after like the past few years. And people are already saying that it's dated. And I just really don't believe that any of these materials are bad or something you need to worry about as long as they are call back to the beginning of the video, authentic materials that are applied in a functional and practical way, there's always a nice way to work with them and design around them in a way that is timeless. So yeah, I think that's all I'm gonna leave you guys with for this week. I hope this was fun and interesting. Uh, if you're not already subscribing and you enjoyed this, feel free to follow along for some more fun little design chats, and I'll see you soon. Love ya!